Okay. Just in order to introduce uh, the panel, I'll start off in Catalan. I might end up speaking in English. Well, we'll see. But since you will understand me better in Catalan and they are getting translation, I, I just wanted to make a brief introduction. I wanted to, well, touch upon what it means to be a woman and work in innovation uh, fields because I'm a blogger. It's not so innovative to have a blogger today, but in 2007 when I opened my blog, it was quite a pioneering action to do. So I always tell something that I don't really like to tell, but it's quite real. I wouldn't be here had I not started writing the blog or having an internet presence, because if well, if I I, I had a, a nickname on internet, it was an acronym D R G. So the fact that first my talent was shown, uh, first people could see and check what I did, before knowing that I was a woman, because you know D. R G. Nobody knows if it's a man or a woman. So that's what technology offers us, to show the talent before showing the gender. And that's very sad, but that's the way it is, and it's very important today. I wanted to mention these as an opportunity for women to show their talent in a field like the network, where, well, it's a more gender-neutral sphere. And that's OK, but at the same time, Google, Internet, the social media still show very strong and powerful patriarchal elements. I am. Um, doing research regarding youth and the new technologies. I'm a psychologist, so I focus on how technologies change the way youngsters think. And I'm focusing on a phenomenon that is warning parents and the educational world. This phenomenon that, well, young people Google everything. And what happens when a teenager starts to Google things, well, questions about sex or other concerns. If we look at the Google results regarding sex quests, well, that's it's quite mm, troublesome. It's not the right thing to do because, well, Google, we are letting Google define what sexuality is, and Google is transferring patriarchal elements from the porno, from the porn industry, and that's not what we should aspire to. Obviously, we must be aware of the fact that the net internet is fantastic, but we have to work on the ethics of it. And this set, and I will not rumble anymore. I will introduce the first of the speakers, Stephanie. I really like her profile. She will talk about values. Stephanie is the Kickstarter ambassador. If you are well knowledgeable about the internet, you know what Kickstarter is and what it represents in the field of innovation because it makes things possible. In I mean, making it possible in terms of money funding, which is the most practical element of any internet idea. She's, she worked in art uh, projects, uh, non-profit ones, uh, supporting different artists and different creative public projects. Uh, she was an associate uh, director in uh, learning and engagement in New York, and she worked with Google, Ghostly International, and the Creators Project. She has a master's degree uh, by the Arts Institute of, Ch of Chicago and also by the, uh, the Rutgers University. I think that she can well contribute with very interesting elements because she's a woman. She has a connection with the art world and she is connected to the internet sphere. We can discuss this later, but internet is a woman. The gender of internet is female gender, is the connections, everything that has traditionally been uh, f f female. Sorry, my microphone was not working properly. Do I have to repeat everything? No, okay. So Stephanie has the floor. Is my microphone? Yeah, okay, good. Take this out for now. Hi, <laughs> give me one second.
Hi. <laughs> um, so Stephanie Pereira, I lead um, International Partnerships for Kickstarter. And today I'm going to talk about women um, and women, how we can use the internet uh, to elevate and amplify our work. Um, so earlier this week, I was very lucky in that I was uh, at a, an event organized by an organization in New York called POW Arts, which exists to support women working in the arts. I saw a talk from these two fantastic people. One is Catherine Levine, who is the founder and CEO of a project called why am I spacing on this? Art Space, <laughs> um, which is an incredible internet uh, digital platform. And Julia Kagansky, who is the director of New Inc., which is the new incubator program coming from the New Museum, which works at the intersection of design and art and technology. So Catherine talked about brand and specifically personal brand and how we can use the digital platforms to elevate and amplify our personal brands. And then very similarly, without any planning at all, Julia talked about visibility and how important visibility is in not uh, just doing great work, but making our work visible. So both of their talks really resonated with me and then reminded me a few months ago of this incredible article I read, um, which was the cover story of The Atlantic in uh, April 2014. And it was talking about confidence and the problem sort of that these authors state, you know, you can take it or leave it, was that the uh, in the professional workplace, the biggest sort of gender gap issue is that men are confident generally and women are not. Um, and again, take it or leave it, but this is some of the research they cited in this theory. Men consistently overestimated their abilities and subsequent performance and that the women routinely underestimated both. Women applied for a promotion only when they believed they met 100% of the qualifications listed for the job. Men were happy to apply when they thought they could meet 60% of the requirements. And men initiate salary negotiations four times as often as women do, and that when women do negotiate, they ask for 30% less money than men. So, confidence. Uh, I think we can take these three themes, confidence, personal brand, and visibility, and talk about how women are, of course, innovating every single day. But that really doesn't mean much if we don't show that off and amplify that work. So I think uh, sort of in relation to today's talk, I want to talk about how we can make women leaders visible. And I think the internet is a powerful place for doing so. Uh, so I happen to be reading this book right now. It's called The Cycle. It's written by a very lovely man named Michael Kaiser. Uh, he's responsible for turning around the Kennedy Center, which is a leading performing arts center in the States. It's in Washington, DC. And he has a way of thinking about organizations and how he can sustainably advance our work through something he thinks of as institutional marketing. Institutional marketing is distinct from but related to programmatic marketing. So he defines institutional marketing as a series of activities that builds belief in the organization as a whole and creates a feeling that this organization is truly special. So if we're thinking about this in terms of marketing your personal brand, we can replace organization for person and say a series of activities that builds belief in the person as a whole and creates a feeling that this person is truly special. Um, but before I talk about some of the specifics that he uses that I've been using thinking about my own personal work, uh, there's this core idea that he talks about a lot in the book, and this is building a family. A family is a group of loyal supporters that you nurture and grow through consistent and focused attention. And the good news is, because of the internet, because of all the tools and resources we have at our hands, we're actually consistently engaged with a lot of people all the time. Privacy issues aside, of course. Um, so once you've identified your family, you know who they are and you know how to reach them. So then you can figure out the appropriate, appropriate vehicles for creating that uh, consistent engagement. So there's a bunch of online channels, of course. So obviously, um, there's websites. And Carrie has a great website, which we'll see. Um, nothing of, <laughs> but she does. Uh, but this is actually a screenshot of my friend Emily Baltz's website. So this is something that is, it used to be very difficult to create a website. As uh, Dolores intimated, it was like very pioneering. Now it's something that anybody can have for free or cheap. You can make something this beautiful for really with no skills at all. Um, and this is also, Emily has a regular newsletter that she sends. And she does this great thing where, like, look at the subject line of her newsletter. Seats available Monday, Armory Week stage dinner. She's put her name next to Armory Week, which is like a major art event. Um, and she's advertising herself. She's saying to you, I'm up to wonderful things. It's at the Armory, which is wonderful. And even if you don't come, I'm pretty awesome. Um, so I'm pretty constantly reminded of how amazing Emily is. And because she has such a beautiful website, whenever someone says to me, do you know an incredible designer, photographer, food designer, et cetera, 
cetera, I say, check out this woman, Emily Baltz. I send them to her website, et cetera. Uh, two is events. So this is part online, part offline. Uh, the offline part is, of course, that you can use events to gather people together so they can talk about you. Um, and this is to celebrate your successes. So let's say you organize an art show, you invite everyone over, you talk about the art show and the art and the incredible artists, but it's also to say, look what I did. Um, you also need to be ready to talk about yourself. This is something Michael talks a lot about in terms of arts institutions, but as people we can do. It sounds a little weird, but it's true. And have talking points. What are you excited about? What are you thinking about? Who are you working with next? This is something that we do naturally and we have to be very good at. And then the internet, of course, comes in and that when you advertise the event the way that Emily does and then when you document it after, it's an opportunity to continue to amplify that message and get people to share it with each other. Um, align with established leaders. So I, you guys probably can't read this, but I happened to get this email yesterday and I thought, how perfect. This is an email from Paola Antonelli, who's the curator of design at the Museum of Modern Art. And she writes, from Paola and Emily, invite to MoMA R&D Salon. So Emily Spivak is a young woman who's just emerging on the scene. She's a writer and she uh, has a very interesting creative project that she has been working on that Paola is quite taken with. And Paola has taken Emily under her wing and sent this email out on her behalf. So not only have they organized an event together, but they're consciously aligning their two brands or their two identities. Um, press, and this is, this is actually Julia, going back to her for a second. This is her current Facebook profile picture, which is amazing. Um, I think, you know, individuals, we don't think about getting press for ourselves, but why not? Um, and I think when we do, we should also not be shy about celebrating it. Publishing, I think Dolores' point was excellent in that uh, anyone can be a publisher, anyone can be a writer in today's day and age. This is my friend Megan O'Connell's blog. Not only does she collect all her writing and publish work on her blog, she also has this incredible portfolio page where she has quotes about how great she is as well as uh, select work. Uh, Self-publishing has also become a thing. So this is a recent book that was published by some friends of mine. Uh, it really is just an extension of a writing circle they've run for a number of years. It's a number of conversations and essays that they collaboratively worked on. Maybe individually they didn't have the time or the resources to pull it off, but they were able to do it as a group. And then it's just print on demand through Lulu. Um, so through all of these vehicles, we can build an image of excellence and accomplishment. And according to Michael Kaiser, and I agree with him, image is everything because, again, the work we do, unless we amplify it and share it, um, it goes unnoticed and unrecognized and we don't have an opportunity for leadership. So the first step, of course, is recognizing our own work. And I know I'm guilty of this. I often don't even take the time to look at what I'm doing, looking at it and even acknowledging that it's interesting. Um, and then finding the confidence, of course, to talk to people about it. Uh, I've created a checklist <laughs> for, for myself, but I thought I'd share it with you guys, where you, maybe it's a schedule. Uh, maybe you're asking yourself regularly, what am I working on? How do people know about it? And then just making it a practice, making it a daily practice. Um, so maybe some of that stuff I just showed you is like high level. I don't think so, but just in case, here's some small steps. Um, I recently had a meeting with a guy, a very important, very exciting guy, and afterwards he wrote me an email I really enjoyed meeting with you, but I looked at your LinkedIn profile and it doesn't look like you're up to much. And I, I freaked out. Uh, and I realized that when people Google me, the top hit is my LinkedIn profile. So I immediately went in and I backfilled it with all these projects I've been working on over the years, which was actually wonderful for me because I didn't realize how much I'd been doing. Um, get a proper headshot. Again, you come up, how you look on the internet come up. Uh, social media, this is powerful. Um, and then publishing and talks. I obviously, this is not easy for anybody to do, and here I am doing it, and it's good. Uh, and then I think this is the most important, and guys, you, you are part of this message. Um, women tend to be very, very generous with each other. We have endless coffee dates, we pass each other work, we recommend each other for jobs. We have always been behind the scenes networking and working together to lift each other up. So this is the next step to work together to amplify each other. Check in with your friends, ask them what they're working on, scold them if they haven't posted online in a while or shared that information. Help them to share that information. Um, so this is me without a proper headshot. Uh, feel free to email me or tweet at me. Thanks. Stephanie's presentation because there is something I always say when we talk about well, here, women, technology, and the internet. Uh, so we are taught as women, we mistake um, privacy with confidence. So we grow up telling 
uh, girls, mothers tell girls, don't publish this, don't publish that, be careful with what you post on the internet. So we grow up, and when we are twen around 20, well, you have to publish everything you do, because if you do not amplify, you do not disseminate your, your work, you know one. And we are kind of ashamed of posting things on the internet. This is a characteristic of women. I always say, Egos. We need to have an ego. You don't have egos, women, girls, guys here? No, I, I'm not telling you to go on the net and spend the whole day talking about yourself. No. But if you are given an award, just post it on the internet. And as Stephanie said, you have to repeat and repeat again and again the things that you're good at and your work and the nice things and your achievement. I think it's very important that we we are most more boastful, that we boast a little bit more about ourselves. I really I really loved your presentation, Stephanie. Very interesting. Very, very interesting when it comes to creating your digital identity. Like to introduce Hiromi. She has been a teacher and she has created the Design Fictions Grant. You know, the pronunciation of the Spaniards in English is not all that good, so excuse me for the pronunciation of these names. That's why I'm talking in Catalan, because I knew that my English pronunciation would be horrible. But Hirome is Sputnikol, she's an artist, she's a researcher of the impact on technology and the evolution of the world of music and cinema, and as a communicator, she uses social networks and video online platforms to uh, disseminate her work in order to promote the debate outside of the traditional uh, spheres of art. Her work has received many awards and acknowledgement, and this last year she was cons she was named one, the, one of the 100 most uh, influential people in Japan. So I give her the floor. Hiromi can talk to us about her work. Thank you. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, I'm going to move up here. And do you see my. Oh, you don't. Drag it over. Yeah, I should drag it over, right? Um, how do I do this? <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, I, I, f I forgot my laptop in my hotel, so I'm going to do a quick presentation using my website, spontnickel.com. And if no. you want to know more about me, just explore my website. You, you get to know more. So I'm an artist, designer, and um, I'm an assistant professor at MIT Media Lab. I just started a new research group called Design Fictions. And what I'm really interested in is designing for debate. And when I say design for debate, I think the word design, when you hear the word design, people often think you know designing a water bottle that's easier to drink or designing something beautiful, designing something functional, you know, designing to solve a problem. But I'm interested in designing to ask questions about the world, designing to imagine what the world could be or what the future could be. And I use the word could instead of should because it's not a moralistic thing. It's not like we should be doing this or you should be stopped doing that. It's more about opening up this discussion space. Like what if I use this, what if I do that? So anyhow, um, because I only have like 10 minutes, I'm gonna show you probably one of the most famous, well, well-known projects. It's called um, Menstruation Machine, Takashi Steak. And basically here, I, if you go down, I designed a machine that allows men to experience the five-day process of menstruation. So <laughs> on the abdomen, there are these electrodes that give this very dull pain on the stomach. And at the back, there's a tank that stores 80 milliliters of blood that slowly trickles down between the legs. And I designed this machine uh, with a world expert on menstruation, Professor Jan Brozens, who knows everything about menstruation, hormonal changes, pain. He knows much more than me about menstruation. <laughs> and I designed the machine, and I also created a story about this character. He's Takashi. Uh, 
which, uh, who is a transvestite man who feels unsatisfied by just dressing up uh, aesthetically through fashion and makeup as a woman, that he wants to dress up biologically, menstruation onto himself to maybe truly understand what it might feel like to be the female gender, and maybe join in with the PMS girl talks that other, his friends are having. And Sputniko, because I'm a musician, I wrote a song about him and about him making the machine, wearing it, and going out in Tokyo with his girlfriends. And I'm going to show you this video, which I posted on YouTube. I'll show you only a snippet of it because I don't have that much time. So what I like to do when I design for debate, I always feel that if the debate just stays inside the museum or symposium, that's really boring. And if you want to ask questions to more people, we had the social media available to you. So, you know, why not use YouTube, Twitter, Facebook to spread the question and discussion outside of the traditional spheres? So I sort of deliberately use the pop language and the music and made it into a J-pop music video. So I'm going to talk over this video as I should. So I actually created this video as my graduation project at Royal College of Art in London. And when I posted this on YouTube, it went so viral. It was blogged on Gizmodo, Wired, Boing Boing, all over the place. And the video got uh, over 100,000 hits in just one week. And it went so viral that the curator at Museum of Contemporary Art Tokyo saw this video online and invited me to show in the museum next to like artists like Matthew Barney or like Jan Faber when I was only 25. So three months after graduation, I was showing a museum. The year after that, Paola Antonelli from New York MoMA, you were mentioning her, she invited me to show in MoMA. And then uh, April this year, four years after I showed this on YouTube, MoMA did a whole debate event based on this project. So they had three hours of debate with a moderator and you know, a fashion editor, Mickey Boardman, and a feminist scholar talking about this work. So that's a pretty sort of design for, as a designer for a debate person, that, that's a very exciting thing that happened with this project. And anyhow, there are more projects, but um, going on to the next topic. So, I work a lot on social media. I speak out a lot. I'm a heavy Twitter user. And sometimes interesting things happen. And I'm going to talk about this interesting thing that happened recently, is that um, this is a news. So do you see this picture of a woman attached to a cable and cleaning the house with this broom? Well, this is actually the cover of an academic journal for artificial intelligence. And that's supposed to be the future of artificial intelligence. A woman cleaning the house at that sure cable. So when I saw this, I wrote on Twitter, OK, isn't this pretty inappropriate for an academic journal to say this is the future of artificial intelligence? And to me, that made perfect sense. It is inappropriate. But I didn't realize that in Japanese society, a lot of people didn't see an issue in this cover image. And actually, I got a lot of, lot of opposition again from uh, otaku, like manga and anime fans. And they felt threatened that I was trying to control their expression. And for me, it's more about the cover of an academic journal portraying the future of artificial intelligence. Like, that's. But then um, I got so much cyberbullying when I tweeted this. And after I tweeted that this could be inappropriate, I got hundreds and thousands of attacks every single day for the next one week. And I was getting rape threats, death threats, all sorts of horrible things said to me. And at that time, um, I just, I got married at the, like a week before when I tweeted this, and they exposed my wedding photos. They were writing terrible things uh, be, uh, below my wedding photos. So I was completely traumatized. So that 
was that created such an explosion of cyberbullying that it became an article in the Japanese national newspaper Asahi. And after that was a newspaper, BBC picked up this uh, uh, whole article. And then a German newspaper blog, Die, Die Spiegel, I, I can't pronounce there. Die Spiegel, yeah, they did an article. And just from one tweet, it went all over the place. And this was an interesting experience. I felt so traumatized at the time that I almost felt scared to tweet or speak out. But then, you know, I kind of got over the whole, after I got over it, I felt, okay, they can't stop me. They can't si silence me. I have to keep on talking, talking, talking. And I think especially um, in Japan where I grew up, where sometimes, um, sometimes women in Japan tend to be seen as, you know, you have to be conservative. You don't really speak out your opinion. And I think it's important for someone like me to be, you know, talking about these issues. So I think one interesting thing is that Vogue Japan awarded me Woman of the Year last year. And I think they recognize the fact that I, I sort of really actively speak out about these issues. And I, I'm from, a, like, I'm an artist, so I'm not from like a major record company, or I'm not from like big agency, but you know, I use internet as a tool to talk about critical, challenging issues, and I try to use these pop videos to spread these discussions. And it, it's, it's really nice that they awarded me this. And I also published a book called um, The Power of Odd One Out uh, last November. And that is actually a book that's sort of mimicking the sort of, you know, the typical teenage self-help books, you know, how to be a good grown-up, you know, like step one, step two. Well, it's all sort of written in that format, but if you read closely, it's very like radical, like Spotniko kind of contents. And because um, I felt that um, a lot of girls in Japan had confidence issues, you know, like they feel that, you know, maybe they're not capable of doing something when they can. And, you know, obviously in Japan, if you go to a big company, all the big, all the managers, like male politicians, male, and sometimes it's good to have that role model to really, you know, look up to or dream about your own future. So, so that book was, um, pretty, like it sold 40,000 copies so far and it's still selling and I get a lot of teenagers writing me emails and tweeting me about what they thought about the book, which is nice. So I hope that's within 10 minutes. So that, that's like a snippet of what I do. Um, so that's Sputnikov's presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Interesting. Um, it's important to highlight how social media in general is widening, is, is making it easier to see that that is true and that that isn't true. Before, it was just the models, the social icons. Uh, everything was standard and everything was uh, by consensus. But people like her and many others that are publishing things on internet are defining new models and things that are different and I think that the word is diverse I think that we live in a society of diversity thanks to internet and that is one of the great things that internet has brought to our world it's contributing to have a more diverse world a more tolerant world even though I don't like that word tolerant but in uh, there is I think it's a positive exploitation of the difference, but in, uh, in a positive way. Now let me introduce our last speaker, that is Kelly Emsley. And she has been a producer and she has specialized in arts. She's been working in that field for over 15 years. She is a producer that's well known internationally with uh, audiovisual projects. And her experience brings together the work of uh, um, the professionals from the world of the museums. And uh, previously, she worked as a producer for United Visual Artists, producing during that period the uh, 
uh, kinetic uh, chorus, and she won a prize for them in 2010. She's a co-founder of Parlor Culture, which has the support of DCMS in the UK Arts Council as part of the program meeting the Cultural Challenge Legacy. So I give her the floor for 10 minutes. Start thinking about questions, because then when she finishes, it's your turn. Okay, hi. Thanks. Just one sec. Play. Anyone? Oh, hi, Stephanie. That's Stephanie promoting herself. Where am I here? Hang on a sec. This is me. Okay, I thought I'd use this time and the questions Dolores raised to think about how we can make a small business case for working in the arts based on feminine intuition, emotional intelligence, and authenticity. I could probably stop now because pretty much these emojis sum, sum it all up of what we do and how, we, how I aspire to live my business life. And when I mean business, I mean people like this. So I spend a lot of my time in a male environment uh, with incredibly intelligent computer scientists, engineers, electronic engineers, artists, people who make insane things and take on mad challenges because they want to and they want to bring, you know, a really, really powerful art that is accessible to people to the world. So that's pretty much what I do a lot of the time, 90% men. So. I was born in the 70s, and why I mention that is because I was brought up as a feminist by nature. So from day one, I was taught that I was as good as a man, and I could do anything a man could do. I could wear knitwear the same way as my brother could. He's pretty good at knitwear too. Um, now that's not the case now. I don't think being raised a feminist is necessarily how things are these days, and I think that's a shame. But why I mention it is because as a producer, you have to have practical skills. And, you know, I could gut a fish when I was four. So instead of talking about the work I do, I wanted to share with you the people who've made it possible. And the reason that each one, each woman in this sort of presentation has given me um, are really established figures in the industry in their own rights. So Lara Bowen is the head of digital delivery for Ogilvy Red Redworks, and what she taught me is, and what she does is, she brings emotional intelligence and a feminine um, kind of value system into large corporate um, environments, and she changes and catalyzes their success rates through doing that. So Lara was the first person who ever told me what a producer was. This is my son. Why I mention that I'm a parent is because it has a massive impact on how we spend our lives and how we do our work lives. And someone like Seth is the key to the future of fem feminism and the future of how we you know, share and educate our young men. This is Kerry Hand. She's an incredible gallerist. She's had huge success for 15 years. And she taught me about the values and the layers of you know, understanding contemporary art and being able to explain that. Because if you can't articulate the product you're selling or you're sharing, then you might as well just give up. Kathleen Soriano, the head of the arts, she single-handedly transformed the way we, we understand the Royal Academy of Arts in London. She mentored me for two years and she taught me the most basic thing was to trust your gut instinct. And I think a lot of education kind of wipes that out of you. But to have someone in her position and her success sort of remind you that your gut is the most important thing was really, really invaluable. Mel Brimfield, she's an incredible artist. And what she taught me ab about was rigor and a sense of humor and that you can make highly conceptual work that is absurd and wonderful at the same time. And you have an unwavering dedication to that. So Mira. Mira's, Mira Calix is an artist that is primarily known for her sound work, but I do, I produce all her physical objects. And Mira has an iron will and a level of determination to succeed and grow that I've never come across before, and that's what she's given me through working with her. Mimi. Mimi's son is an artist in Seoul and Korea, 
and I've been working with her through UVA and she's taught me a lot about grace and restraint and understanding about decision making and who's in the room and how you can tackle that without even being confrontational. Ona Haja, Ona's just taken up the direct executive director post at the Arts Science Museum in Singapore. Ona's fascination with the value of science and art and how you know, that needs to permeate all kinds of commissioning is what's taken her to Singapore now. And I think we all see a lot of really incredible stuff coming out of there in the next few years. Katie Patterson, an award-winning artist, only 30 years old. She graduated from the Slade. Katie takes concepts of the world around us and the universe that are so complex that someone like me, who's quite a lay person, kind of, I don't really read scientific papers or grasp that kind of thing, but her work is singularly beautiful as an object and massively accessible to people. So I've learned that a lot from her. And Julia, Julia gets a big up here. Julia, to me, exemplifies the younger generation of women coming practitioners out of New York that have um, really high caliber education, they understand museum practices, and they understand the power of the network and social media. So Julia, what she's doing at the incubator in the new museum is changing institutional structures through connectivity and sharing. Lucy McRae. Lucy's a body architect. I didn't know what a body architect was until I met Lucy. Lucy is someone who's using her body and her uh, filmmaking talents to sort of share with us the future body and all the narratives that come around that. And I find that massively fascinating. And we haven't done anything together, but we might. And lastly, taking me back to New Zealand, where I'm from, is Lyle Hakariah. Lyle's a performer and a curator. But Lyle runs a tiny little space called Vogue Fabrics in Dalston that is the home to people who want to explore sexuality and gender identity in a, in a way that is safe, is free. It's wrapped up as a club night, but actually what it does is he creates a free space for young people to explore gender and positioning of who they are in a way that allows for transformation that I, don't, I think very few people do. So those are the people and those are the values that sort of, I think, sum up what I do as a producer and as a woman working in the arts today. And so rather than showing you endless projects of I did this, I did that, I wanted to share with you those people because through collaboration and through their generosity, they've enabled me to thrive. Um, and I think if we can all keep that and keep that integrity and authenticity in the way we conduct our business and our collaborations, then the world and women will be in a much better place. That was fantastic. I think we've had a great sample of uh, women and art, and we have seen people that uh, they work with and people that they have been influenced by. And I think that uh, she hasn't talked about theoretical concepts, but rather she has shown us the value that a woman can bring to the current world, to the world, to the future world as well. And the key, as you have seen, are the relationships, nothing more than relationships. So I like very much. I mean, it looked very good with the ideas that she said that she would bring to us, you know, these ideas of feminine values and used in uh, uh, this sector, and she has shown us how she has shown us what she uh, gives value to, and that's the people that she works with. When I said that internet is a woman, internet is a relationship, social media is these relationships between human beings, and uh, they have this relational impact on all of us. Well, thank the th I'd like to thank the three of you very much. Uh, I have some questions, but I think the most important ones will come from our audience or the ones that uh, I would like to hear are the ones that come from you. So let me begin with the, the one that arose as first uh, when I was asked to moderate this uh, roundtable. And that's what I said at the start. Is it true? I'm going to do it in Catalan. Um, is int does internet truly make it easier for women's work to be projected, to be seen, to 
overcome the initial invisibility, um, the invisibility of gender? Does internet favor uh, this? And do, do the women understand? Uh, uh, did you understand the question? Yes. To begin. No. Yes. No. I. I can. <laughs> yeah, studying is easy because, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I can answer everything you guys were thinking. <laughs> so um, the, the question is, um, I think internet has the two sides y you were mentioning. So, you know, um, internet made it accessible for us to speak out. So, you know, I think the word sort of popular had a bad name before because you know only commercial things went on the media because very few people access the media like commercial or like uncritical unchallenging is like being on the media had that kind of really you know association but now you could make something challenging spread something critical spread so it's an exciting time but what i see online being an active online <laughs> artist and also after the cyberbullying incident is that internet sometimes amplifies what it is true today like amplifies hate yeah and amplifies gender inequality or misogyny because this is a space where you could speak out what you're n not supposed to speak out in public so these terrible words can come out online. And I can't imagine what it would be like if I were a 12 year old or teenage now growing up seeing these amplified opinions online. I could see a world where it could produce more amplified people. And that's something that really everyone should be thinking about. Muy interesante, yo. Very interesting. As a matter of fact, I was going to say before that internet should also, uh, I don't know if the English translation was too easy, but we it's getting us used to having broader shoulders. So we are not uh, talking to a controlled, to a specific audience. We are talking to an audience which is totally out of context, and it may mean that our message will be well received or as poorly received as uh, she has just explained to us happened to her. So I think that it shouldn't be a negative element if we know how to manage it positively, because that can provide us with feedback. And in this case, it didn't occur. It was a question of hate. And sometimes if we think about the politicians, well, criticisms are not that bad. And it, it, it can lead us to do things more positively. But yes, what you're saying is true. It, it highlights the best and the worst in human beings. And that's why I always insist that the best thing about internet is that we have a world of infant possibilities and now more than ever the most important thing are culture and values ethics and culture I think that these are the elements that will help all of these infinite possibilities that we have on internet to be better people to be a better world and not to be a worse to be worse people and a terrible world which would also be possible I mean it could happen uh, yeah equality <laughs> question no um, so yeah the internet can be the internet um, sorry, I'm hearing myself be translated. <laughs> um, I, and I've seen a lot of that bullying. We see it on Kickstarter because of the gaming community that it overlaps with what happens on Kickstarter. Um, but it, I think the, the power is what inspires me. I, I worked with teenage girls for a very long time. Um, and, you know, g girls who find each other in gaming forums and end up chatting in the chat rooms and then who create um, diaries together. You know, girls who live around the world who've never met in person but who are sharing, who are, have those questions you brought up earlier. They have questions about sex and sexuality that they can't talk to about their parents. And when they Google it, the answers aren't quite right, but they, ha they are able to find each other and connect with each other and have those weird fringe conversations that certainly were not kosher when I was growing up because there was no internet um, and uh, you know there's also like there's some crazy uh, 
like reinventions of the way there's I think there's a lot happening so there, there's a lot happening I mean there's the, the broad shoulders thing is really influential I think um, the gaming community is actually really interesting because I think people are learning how do you moderate these forums where I think a lot of the cyberbullying was born um, but I also have seen on tumblr I've seen these incredible communities of teenagers who like are reinventing family and reinventing the way we define relationships with each other and like even language like I've stumbled into some of these and been and totally clear and it was like the most exciting moment I felt for, I felt both really old, but also really thrilled to see a new edge that uh, I knew we were truly doing something creative and constructive online and not just uh, echoing and amplifying things that we hear from each other in a, in a negative way. Interesting, because there are studies that begin to show how internet is uh, diluting the effect of gender when you see the creation before knowing if it's a man or a woman behind it when you're seeing diversities of family models and of sexual tendencies when they today you are making all these different realities visible what you're doing in one way or another is to dilute the border the uh, border between men and women so i think that's this a wonderful study that i like very much imagine a boy a child 30 years ago uh, coming to uh, it's a group uh, of, of, of peers saying, you know, I'm really mad because my girlfriend left me. I mean, they would not have accepted that 30 years. They would have smacked him and said, don't do that. 30 years, they would never have been able to show their feelings like they do on Facebook where, you know, now currently the girls say, hey, poor thing, we're with you. We understand. We'll take care of you. Don't worry. So this feminization of the male role is very positive. And it is an, an extension of the uh, emotional side, which is very positive, among many other things that I think internet is helping us with in this uh, dilution or dissolution of the strict lines between uh, between uh, genders. What I'm yeah, not going to do that. I'm not really um, as well versed in internet culture as the other people on this panel, but I'm going to sort of take it offline because I think how you behave online is really dictated by your actual life and you live here today now. So I think that, you know, if we can't use the skills that we have through collaborating and all of those kind of, you know, the way you conduct yourself, and I think Stephanie pointed it out with the notion of family. Mm -hmm. And in art and design communities, because it's a kind of very challenging environment to professionally thrive in, if you don't build a family that support you, internationally then it's very difficult and very isolating so i think you know you've got to take some of this kind of off online speaking out and declaring yourself and publicizing yourself and critical design and speculative future and you've got to share that in the way you live day to day Yes, that's very interesting. When we talk about internet, I agree. I'm talking a lot from the point of view of internet, but maybe I shouldn't do it because the concept that we are using is that of the post-digital society. It's that society where the internet values are being you know, spread to um, to the society in general. For example, the bicy bicing, the service bicycles in the city wouldn't exist if there wasn't Spotify, perhaps. And now we are seeing that there are values from internet that are being conveyed to the street, to everyday life. I mean, Kickstarter is a very new uh, initiative in, on internet, but you know that uh, there were traditional figures that were very old and, and that had the, in Mexico, for example, that has a collaborative communities. And now what we're doing is taking that to internet and taking advantage of the great power that that has. But the idea comes offline. The idea of offline online is, I always say that it's f for the for the older folks, when you make a distinction between online, offline, well, we shouldn't be talking about that. We should be talking about the reality because the reality is both online and offline. So let me go to the questions that we had prepared, the more official questions for our debate. Let's see if I can get into my computer. Okay, here we go. Now, that would be to see a series of issues, of questions. The qu 
some of these questions were very broad. I don't know how you're going to be able to answer these, but I'm sure you'll do your best. What is the feminine approach to innovation? What do you think is the main element that women bring to the table in innovation? Uh, okay. Who wants to, to begin? Mm. Um, yes, you're, it's you're, a pretty broad question. Was about that. Um, I just think that we, if you, it's really the the values that you ascribe to your professional yes. life have to be ones that are almost non-gender specific. But when you talk about emotion and involving feelings, where people go, "Oh, you're so emotional," "You're so melodramatic," or "You're so," mm. but actually, there's a lot to be gained from um, intelligent emotional behaviour in in work and in research. So I would say that's what women or feminism or any of those labels can bring is that that sort of not over sentimentalizing things but using that power to to make good decisions. Jo penso que ens ho ha mostrat, eh? La seva presentació ha set una ha estat una mostra, una resposta a aquesta pregunta, eh? Quins són I think that's a very good response when we ask about uh I think that's in, uh, well, basically she was innovative in her presentation by presenting all of the people that she has worked with or that inspire her on the screen. So that's an example. What do you think? <laughs> I didn't find myself enough time. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, I can, uh, to be frank, this is something I wrestle with every day. I mean, I am an emotional, I'm in a deeply, I'm a very feminine person. Um, and uh, I find myself in an increasingly professional environment that is often controlled by men. And um, I actually take issue with some of those points about confidence in that article I read, but I also do lack confidence. So um, these are things that uh, I look to my male and female peers to um, just honestly, openly reflect on. Uh, confront and just, I think, you know, we actually at work we do talk a lot about communication and transparency. And I would say that that, that is a value that masculine, feminine, whoever can, people can get behind and that's something that we can use to sort of put all this stuff on the table and really like advance the agenda. When things are difficult, it does not have to be a secret the way maybe it had been in the past. If I may make a joke, uh, uh, women take multitasking to internet because that's something that we've always been doing, but uh, it's just a joke. It's just a joke, but it's a strategy to make us work harder. Since you can do several things at the same time, they say you can work, you can study, you can take care of the family, etc. They take advantage of us, but it was a joke nonetheless. But I thought that perhaps the words haven't come out, but I think it would be interesting to bring them up when we talk talk about emotional intelligence, it's really all about empathy. We're talking about empathy. We're talking about uh, that on internet, there's a general communication of to connect with people, and in internet, you have people that are closer to you. They're not on the other end of the screen, but rather they're in your social network. And the empathy, empathy then, is a feminine quality, and uh, it's something that we have worked on for many years. It's very powerful, and it should take on great power. The fact of being empathetic is very important, I believe. Personally, it's hard for me to define what's a feminine quality or not, but you know the, the fact that you were born and you grew up as a woman, you could, I've got boobs and I've got, you know, it's like just that fact you're, you're from a different background. It's good to have a diversity of people in innovation because, you know, the diversity creates creativity more and, you know, you could, be more aware of different needs. So uh, it's just, it's, it's a good thing, I think. And a feminine approach, because um, I'm, I'm kind of a bit scared of saying this is feminine or this is not, but I feel that, okay, if, you know, statistically it's true that women tend to be sort of, you know, less selfish and more sort of compassionate, then, it, it, you know, if that's the case, then I guess right now it's such a social age. You know, there's social media cre creates more connections and more connected you can be. You know, you could create a team. I, I work with a team when I make works. 
especially when I was a student, I didn't have any money, any connections, but I went on Twitter and said, hey, who wants to work with me? And I gathered a team of 20 people, and it's just a new way of innovation working, and maybe that could sort of match in that sense. But yeah, that, that's my fluffy <laughs> answer. <laughs> Interesting contradiction between the need uh, that I said of, of, of being yourself, of having an ego, uh, even if you're working with a team, you know, to make your name be known as well. That's a value. I agree that uh, the idea of um, values be, uh, being masculine or feminine but, uh, is not the ideal way to look at it. But as she has said, it's important to collaborate. And I do think that uh, women traditionally have always worked more in a family and in collaboration. And we are are transferring that to the network. Also, before, I think it's interesting, um, there are obstacles, barriers, problems. We've heard of some of these in each presentation. Some of these have come up. Would you like to highlight some problems that you may have found, some obstacles uh, in this uh, field? Um, well, there's a really straight out obstacle, then it's talked about, you know, across the world and any kind of like, you know, you can't succeed if you're a parent, you have to sacrifice, you can't be the woman that has it all. All of these articles that say, you can, you can't, you can, you can't, but nobody, if a man works 100 hours a week, nobody comments on that. You know, they get divorced, they lose their children, they get married again. But if a woman does that, she's vilified. If she gives up her children, she's vilified. And so I think that, you know, these choices about work and what you give to it and what you sacrifice are things that I've been personally criticized for. I've been called a bad parent. Mm -hmm. I've been called a bad wife. I've been called mm -hmm. all of these things. I've been called a ball breaker. I've, you know, and if, I was a man producer who was tough and got the job done. Would you call him an insulting word? No. So those are the challenges I've faced personally, but I think that they're ones that any woman in any profession faces who gives a lot of time to their job and goes all over the world and puts their their work before everything else. So that's... Totalmente. Totalmente d'acord. Em totally. Estem aquí i coincidiríem... There are so many women here, and we know that internet has given us the possibility of being more flexible and being able to reconcile our home life and not having to be out of the house all the time. But we have to do multitasking, and we're totally exhausted, and we have fewer opportunities. If you have to do everything, then, uh, well, I was just thinking of an idea. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but if you're passionate about something and you have 10,000 hours of your life to dedicate to it, then you're a genius. And that kind of demythifies the idea uh, if you have 10,000 hours of your life to dedicate, then you can be Einstein or you can be an elite sportsman or whatever. Yes, but how many women have had up till now in history, uh, I mean, we've had so few women in relevant places because there are very few women have had 10,000 hours to dedicate to something that they're passionate about. So I think that we have, uh, many of the women that are here, we have experienced this contradiction. But fortunately, I think it, it we will be overcoming this and improving this over time. Mm, so, it, like my sort of idea of an obstacle. I Actually, I, I do agree with you that I don't have any children, but it's always, I think if you're a woman, and I'm in my late 20s, and doing my career, it's like, do I have children? If I do, when? Do I start now? When? Like, th there are more questions that women are always thinking about as they progress with a career. And you, it's inevitable. Everyone has to be thinking. Whereas, I think, men don't have that many questions. And that's really like, I used to hate it, but I started to think, oh, it's kind of fun that I'm just surrounded by questions. I, I started to enjoy being confused because that's like part of life. But um, that's, I think that sometimes distracts a lot of people. It distracts me too. Like, where do I go? What, what am I doing? And, you know, so that's an interesting distraction. And also, um, right now, the Japanese government started using 
word womanomics because um, women in Japan, they're very highly educated, but a lot of them quit their work after they get married or have kids. So government's saying, okay, if women come in the workforce, our GDP is gonna go up to 16%. <laughs> but they're just missing the whole point that Japanese men are working crazy hours. You can't make everyone work crazy hours. Who's gonna like, ha you know, look after the other things in the family? But you know, that's what they're talking. So sometimes it's just more about balance. It's not about everyone working like robots. It's men have to think about how they li live, not just women. So that, that, that's what I see and feel like recently, yeah. Totally agree. There are a whole series of men that would love to work less and spend more time with their kids. So this uh, blurring of the strict roles is also impacting the male side, and it would be very positive for all of us. As a, as a mother, I'm a mother, and it's very interesting to spend time with your children. Both things in life are important, and that's where the future lies, uh, with a greater equality in this regard. I think that, uh, sorry, uh, I mean, I was raised by a single mom my, my, who worked way too much. Uh, my brother and I looked after ourselves a lot as a result. Um, it impacted who I am as a person. And my dad um, is a very traditional Latin American man, and he also doesn't think you know, very highly of me and my abilities, which is terrible. Uh, so, I mean, for me, the, the obstacles I'm constantly trying to overcome are the world I was born into and the world I'm trying to create. And um, it, I, I think that's a lot on top of everything else. Um, that said, we are fantastic multitaskers. <laughs> and I think we seem to get so much joy from the work that we do get done. And uh, we seem to be killing it. <laughs> Any, I, I had an additional question, but we don't have much time, so I would like to open the floor to the audience. Is there any question from the audience? But Because I think my question has already been answered. So come on, questions, reflections, remarks. From the audience for any of them? A reflection you would like to share with them, criticism, remarks. We need to, we have to accept criticisms, but please don't be harsh. No, you don't have any? Yes, I'll hand the mic over to you. Yes? We've got so many mics, I don't really know which one to use. I'm Valentina. Uh, could you please uh, explain um, a thought that um, seems to me a, a contradiction? Uh, you say that internet is um, female, uh, like uh, it's the yeah. gender of in internet is female. Yes. But uh, you say also that um, model like Google or uh, is patriarch patriarch. Uh, sorry for my English, it's not uh, so good. So, um, could you please uh, uh, explain this uh, kind of contradiction? There is a sociologist in the room, but does it ring the bell, this concept of co-opting, co-optation? So, it goes along these lines. Uh, let me explain you a couple of notions here. Internet is... Uh, promoting the freeing of uh, many dictatorships. The, spring, the Arab Spring wouldn't have been possible without the help given by the social media. Does this mean that Mark Zuckerberg and Google creators and the rest of them are in favor of revolutions and not in favor of neoliberalism? Do, does this mean that these people are open and good citizens? No, that's not the case. But it kind of escaped their control. I haven't said that internet uh, was created to favor feminine values, but it's ending up favoring them. So it's just an evolution of the net. For example, the um, kind of Occupy movement here in Spain. Well, they used the social media, social media that have been created by a neocon or a neoliberal guy like Mark Zuckerberg. Well, it's kind of contradictory, but since we are using 
them. Why do not set a new one, but we have to reach out to the people? I think that um, the same goes for the internet. Uh, the internet was not created to be feminine, but, you know, by chance, because internet is about relationships, um, people, emotions, well, the, the internet is specially connected to all these emotional intelligence elements. That's the idea. L let's make the most of it. Uh, probably had they known that the, in the internet would end up being feminine, they wouldn't have created it. No, I'm being wicked here. But it's true that, well, the the character of these Silicon Valley entrepreneurs is a more open one. Uh, maybe I'm overdoing it a little bit here. I don't know if I've answered your question, but this is a, a matter we could spend days discussing about it. Any other, any other question or reflection or remark from you? Good that a woman posed the first question. When I said, is there any question from the audience? I thought, I'm sure that a man will grab the mic and gender equality will go down the drain. OK, we've got some equity, some gender equality here. A man, we need another woman to think about an additional question. Cool. Um, after your uh, problems with the social networks, Twitter, your hate tweets and everything, how did your uh, relationship with the Twitter or the social media change? or? Or how much time did it take you to recover or to to start a normal uh, activity again? Um, it it didn't take me long for, for me to overcome, but I, I was traumatized for like two weeks. But then, you know, three weeks, I'm back again. But I think it it's a learning experience, and I'm happy that I did it gradually. I, I've always had reactions through my works, but if I would be a bit frightened if I were a high school girl who suddenly had to face this from zero to a hundred. So it's a lot about literacy, learning how to cope. Right now I realize these people, they, they need attention and they feel that by attacking they, they're above, but if I react, it just feeds you know, on their insecurities. So I just ignore everything now. And I realize that's the best way. Like, at that time, it went worse because I was reacting and I was trying to explain why this was inappropriate. <laughs> I was saying one, two, three. I, because I'm a math graduate, I wrote like a proof <laughs> why this is inappropriate. But still they didn't understand. And I thought, okay, they don't want to understand and I'm wasting all my time proving. So I decided to cut it off. Yeah. Any woman? Fantastic. Hola. Uh, Hi. I've, I've come here randomly, actually. I'm part of the Sonar staff, and I've only listened to the end of the panel. I just wanted to make a remark. I was looking at the screen, and I, I, I read moderator, because in Catalan, there is the word moderator for woman and moderator for man, which are different. And it says moderator as in, in, in the masculine uh, form of moderator. I think that this is, well, an it's our unconsciousness or something. But yes, it's true. It's true. We don't really notice it. But it's important to pay attention to language. Language speaks volumes about attitudes. Yeah tiny details, but very important ones. Any other question? Yes, please. Hello. Well, I I want to say that I follow you, I think, all of you on Twitter, uh, both of you also, so, so for sure. But I'm very interested in the idea that Nico talk about the diversity. Uh, because uh, uh, I come from South America and I live in South America and innovation, women in innovation, because uh, 
a society where, like Japan, the, the male dominance is very uh, complicated. How she uh, started the career, her career in these uh, aspects, taking into account the, the uh, cultural uh, problems and the cultural approach, and if she is taking or talking on reflection, uh, has reflection about this specific topic about diversity, cultural, and be a woman in a cultural uh, male dominant culture. Hello. Uh, I feel like I I was very lucky because in Japan, like I am a woman and I'm half British, so I'm considered foreign. And then I'm in my 20s, so uh, you know there's not so much younger generation in the central. So I'm everything that's not mainstream. <laughs> And I don't really belong anywhere. I'm not completely Japanese. I'm not going to be British. I don't belong anywhere, which kind of made me into, I, I sort of tread this line. I, I, I don't know, in Japanese animism, there's these women who, they're called Miko. They wear this like kimono and they have this stick and they try to do fortune telling with this stick, you know? Oh, this is the future of this village. And I think they started, Miko is supposed to be someone on the border between the real world and the spiritual world. So people go to this Miko to ask, what's the spiritual world saying? I'm kind of you seen like a Miko in a weird way. I'm, I'm not foreign or Japanese or women or men, science, arts, like, so in a way, because I'm not anywhere, I sort of became free to say anything because <laughs> I'm not scared of anything. But I was very lucky, I, yeah. So it's a funny spot. And maybe it's a, I don't know it's, if it's true in other cultures, but in Japan, like if I don't look Japanese and if I'm not in this Japanese hierarchy, I'm almost, you, I can say anything and I don't get punished because I'm sort of not anything. So maybe if I were a completely fully Japanese woman, maybe I would have a different um, experience. But I was lucky. I think, I think actually what you pointed out is that all of us on this panel are not who we are, we're not any one thing. None of us are like, I was born in one place, raised in another. You know, we have, we're, we're transformative beings and I think that gives us the power to kind of um, evolve and go beyond from where we come from. And that's both in gender and, and our work as well. Where if you uh, refuse to be defined from where you began, then you can move in any circle and do anything because they're not expecting to see you there, but you might be there, and they don't know if you belong, and that's a lot to do with um, being international and class structures, and you know, if you walk into a corporate environment and you can speak the language of the corporate, or you can speak the language of the commercial art world, or you can speak critical design language, but you don't look like you fit in, what, what actually happens is you confuse people, and in their confusion, you can slip through the cracks, and I think that's something that we can increasingly enjoy. Completely agree. Yo, si, si parleu de, de Latin America, yo, uh, if you talk about Latin America, I know Latin America very well, especially in the educational field, and development, and these gender issues or inequalities uh, belong to this um, underdevelopment in some fields. And technology offers you a golden opportunity because all Europe is in crisis. So you have the opportunity to take a, a quantum leap and, you know, leave us lagging behind Peru, Colombia. There are many countries in Latin America that are already making huge progress thanks to internet and the new technologies. That's where the key success for women uh, lies. The problem is that the woman does not exist in Latin America. She's not present in the labor market. She's not present in executive positions. So, Take, take advantage of this uh, momentum, uh, the fact that everyone has internet at home, etc. I think that this is key for the Latin American woman. 
Technology can be uh, something good, really good for Latin America. We have in, in my country, and uh, because I'm Peruvian, the experience of a one laptop per child. Mm -hmm. But the problem, usually, when you uh, apply a, a technological approach to uh, this, uh, with uh, with context, with this uh, big uh, diversity, because in, you can understand my country have 40 languages, many diversity, indigenous people, and that uh, technology without a, and a very strong uh, design approach in cultural uh, bias is, is always filed. It's something that you put the, the machine there, but the teachers, they don't have the, the, the information, the place, they don't have uh, electricity, or the technology is always thinking about from a Western uh, uh, cognitive uh, approach. And this is something that, and in this case, uh, for instance, I, I research about it, is about the cognitive difference between uh, Western culture and other cultures in order to uh, create and think other narratives, other other um, technologies, and to see other other way to, to create everything. I am I completely agree with you that Latin America, but I think in Arab con Arabic countries too, because I work with them too, they have like a complete difference of see the world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's other it's another framework to think about feelings, about uh, uh, totally. family, about the time, how they think the time. This is completely different. For instance, uh, people from the, the tropic uh, space, they, they see the future in the back and uh, the past in the, in the front because you never see the future, then the future is in your back. This is kind of approach for technology is something that we lost, the, we lost all this diversity. And it's very interesting that you uh, point out about the technology, but uh, sadly, uh, technology is always seen from this uh, specific point of view. Yes, and yes. when you impose this uh, cognitive way of, of create technology or create everything, uh, it's an imposition, and imposition is not working very well. You said a quantum leap. I meant, yeah, a fatal leap sometimes, because sometimes there are casualties along the way. It's true that the cognitive approach is the wrong one, but I prefer to go with technology rather than without it. Because, of course, it's like driving a car without having a car. We have to talk about um, technology, even if not all Latin American citizens have a computer. But you're right. Sometimes there is no electricity in the venue, and it doesn't make any sense to give a laptop to each pupil. But, you know, young people are very clever and nearly natives, and thanks to the technology, they open up to a very diverse new world, and they can know about different ways of thinking, of feeling, of expressing. And, well, the Internet, is this is precisely what it offers. I, I, I just want to respond to that very, very quickly. Um, so I'm, I'm super lucky in that I inhabit a world that very much looks to the future of technology and specifically around the internet, around hardware, around software, around teaching people software as a new language, right? So it's a new way, language. It's a, it's a form of literacy that everyone should have the right for. Um, so you're seeing like companies like, uh, or nonprofits, I should say, like Ushahidi, who are really rethinking the way that the internet is delivered and structured and thinking about these issues you're talking about. And they're actually going to the countries to develop the work. They're not developing it from Boston. They're developing it from within the country that they want to work with. Um, and I think open hardware, and I think micro networks, and Wi-Fi networks, and mesh networks that are you know, created by, I mean, one laptop per child is really interesting because it's so flawed in so many ways, but it actually uh, was almost a major paradigm shift in that it was about wind up power, and solar power, and mesh networks, and open hardware. And um, it, in, it was intended to be hackable so that the kids who learn to use it by learning to use it, they could reinvent it. And so, uh, you know, I work in the education space, or I did at one point in my life, and um, I think it's actually an incredibly exciting time. And I, I do see what you mean. I'm, a, I'm actually a big believer in this like problem with the Western framework, and this came up a little earlier in that there's like a few, a handful of people who are making a lot of decisions for the rest of us, which sucks. But I think that there's actually this incredible groundswell of potential right now. Another question. I agree with you. Internet um, fosters equality. 
because now we have changed on the screen. You have the moderator in a feminine form. Yes. Great. Flexibility is a feminine value. I'm not saying that you're not flexible here at the Sona, but traditionally, women have had to find their way without many means. Was this done by a woman or a man? A man reacted to that, but he did it on the internet, which is a feminine tool. Okay, this has been a collaborative work. Great. Any other question? We are nearly overrunning. If there are no further questions, we will just wrap up. No? Okay, to wrap up. Rather than um, saying conclusions, I don't want to repeat the ideas that have come up here. I think that we all have them clear in mind. I would ask the three speakers to leave us with a sentence or a couple of sentences in two lines. Uh, let me make this even more complicated. What do you imagine regarding gender issues for in the future. So what's your future expectations uh, in terms of gender issues? What would be your your bright future or the future scenario that would be desirable regarding gender issues? It's great to speak about the future. You can say anything because no one has seen it. Um, so First one, you will never forgive me for that. It's fine. So I happen to read a lot of science fiction and um, I have the gift of having seen the future. Um, and uh, a future where people are swapping bodies and swapping personalities, um, which is terrifying. We're living online and offline maybe d too much of the time, um, where men are, are having babies and are nursing babies. Um, I think that biology and um, the way we connect with each other, there's it, that could be an incredible problem to have. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, I'm also excited about the future of biotech and what's going to happen, you know. But um, I, I'm, I also believe in optimism and humor, you know. That maybe that's my personality. It's just be always positive and just move on. Because if you're not having fun, then nothing changes. <laughs> so <laughs> optimism is the key. Yeah. Sin optimismo no hay futuro. O sea, que no. Optimism, there is no future. So yes, we need to be optimistic, otherwise we won't see the future. Actually, I was reading the other day that creativity uh, is done on the basis of optimism, because you need to be creative to improve things. You're not creative to get things worse. Most of us want to be creative to, be, to improve things, to improve reality. Get it. Hmm. I guess mine would be quite easy, is that for a really simple thing for more girls in the world to be educated. That's never going to go away. And the other thing is for people to never lose their belief in transformation, whether you're male or female, because that's what creates great art. Fantastic. Let's wrap up with this final note. Let's not do away with the optimism and excitement, because we need a better world. Thank you very much to all of you. See you next time.